Okay, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our November webinar. Really excited uh, about today's program. If you are unfamiliar with the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, welcome. Um, we are a network of organizations throughout the state of Ohio and regionally working to advance bird conservation. There are around 120 organizations in the network right now, ranging from state and federal wildlife agencies to universities, museums, uh, city and state parks, um, essentially anybody interested in, in conservation of some type. So you can go to our website, obcinet.org, to learn more about what we do and all of the organizations within uh, our network. If you are joining us representing a network and you are not in OBCI, please reach out. Um, if you are interested, we would love to uh, have you involved in, in all the work that we're doing. We had a really great year. Uh, so thanks to Jen and Selby, um, our outreach chairs for OBCI for organizing such a really great webinar series. So I wanna thank all the presenters um, who joined us this year. Uh, we're working on the program for 2023. If you have any ideas for content or speakers that you would like to see, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be just about birds or just about things that are happening in Ohio, please let us know. We would love to know what you're interested um, in hearing about. And we look forward to announcing some of the programs for 2023 very soon. We have the Q&A enabled for today's program. So if you have questions uh, about the presentation at any time during today's program, you can click on the Q&A button and enter your question. I believe I've enabled the upvote uh, setting as well. So if somebody else asks a question that maybe you were thinking about or you'd really love to know the answer, you can upvote those questions so they kind of come to the top. So we'll let our presenter today get through uh, her presentation. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, I'm sure you're gonna have lots of great comments and questions for, uh, for Judy today. If this is your first webinar, or if you maybe have missed some of the more recent ones, we archive all of our presentations on our website. So if you go to obcinet.org and click on uh, webinars under the resources tab, you can learn about all of the past programs that we've had and it links to our YouTube channel where we have recordings of many of those past webinars. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter there to learn about upcoming programs as well. And um, maybe even let us know about, about uh, content that you'd like to see in the future. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker who is Judy Semrock. Um, owner of Nature Spark. She's an area field biologist and a naturalist who spent over 20 years working in the Natural Areas Division as a conservation specialist with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. She's co authored two natural history guides Dragonflies and Damselflies of Northeast Ohio and Goldenrods of Northeast Ohio, a field guide to identification in natural history. Judy's also the founder of Chrysalis in Time, the first Ohio chapter of the North American Butterfly Association, and serves on the board of the Ohio Bluebird Society and Ohio Ornithological Society through their conservation committee. As a former petroleum geologist and middle school science teacher, Judy loves to learn about and share her passion for the natural world through interpretive hikes, PowerPoint programs, and photography. You can learn more about her latest adventures and offering through her new company, Nature Spark. And we'll be sure to share that link in the chat and it's available on our website as well. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Judy to start her amazing presentation. Thank you, Matt, very much. And thank you, Jen, for uh, inviting me to speak today. I think we're all ready to go. So um, I first got started with, I'm gonna just take my little picture off of there. Uh, I first got started with Chimney Swifts more than probably 12 years ago when I was always fascinated with the birds, but a friend helped to help me to put together a tower, which we then attached to the side of a small barn and I would get up on the roof and look down into the into the tower and wasn't seeing anything and wasn't seeing anything. And then after two and a half years, I got up there and looked down in there and sure enough, there was a nest in there with, with a bird sitting on, 
on the nest and ended up sitting on eggs. And after that, it's just been, you know, total fascination. Uh, the photo you see here is of one of my uh, young ones that was inside of the tower and I could look down through the top and take pictures into the into the interior. And then I would just sit out there and watch and, and learn and observe and it's just been fantastic. So let's get on to some uh, information here. So for the physical aspects of chimney swifts, they have this cigar-shaped cigar body, short tail, long pointed wings, which are designed for rapid and sustained flight. Their legs are short and weak with all their toes pointing forward, which keeps them from perching upright like normal birds do. So basically they are always hanging or perching vertically. They can't you know, sit on a, a branch or a roof line or power line or a wire or anything. Uh, that's because the, the feet are obviously part of the ability to hang vertically and then the fact that they cannot be, if you hold them in your hand and you go to release them and you try to throw them up in the air to get them to fly, they don't do that very well. They need to be able to push off. And so hence the rest of the uh, information that I'm gonna give, be giving you about their tail feathers and things like that. So they have, as we go through this, you'll notice that the print or the text will match um, a color in an arrow so that you can better see what I'm referring to in the information. So you can see the yellow arrow that's showing that ridge of feathers above the eyes, which helps to prevent damage from insect collisions. Their average flying speed is 60 miles an hour. They're actually the second fastest bird behind the peregrine falcon and have been clocked at speeds more than 120 miles an hour. Their body length is about five to six inches. So think about the size of a dollar bill. Their wingspan runs anywhere from 12 to 13 and a half inches tip to tip, and they can fly more than a mile in altitude. They weigh about 23 grams, a little less than 23 grams or similar to 20 small paper clips. They live on the average of three to five years, but obviously there are records of those living longer with banding information and, and such. Uh, because they fly so fast, they really don't have a lot of predators that uh, you know, chase after them, but Cooper's Hawk, Sharpies, things like that can be part of what, you know, can, can take them as prey items. Their long claws and their tail bristles are very important to their, basically their natural history because they are used for clinging to vertical surfaces and those tail bristles then help, as you can see in the bottom right photos where the photo, uh, it's actually a drawing from an older, older book, but where they can use that to then uh, push off from when they leave their vertical surface. They feed, bathe, drink, sleep, and collect nest material all while they are in flight. They can also mate in the bottom of the tower or the chimney. And I've heard them do that before with a lot of little squawking and moving around. And cameras now inside of some of these swift towers have, have made observations uh, a lot better, or at least more complete to see what they're doing. So before the, the chimneys and the towers came about, they originally nested in hollow split or cavity riddled trees, especially sycamores or large beech trees, uh, large silver maples that would uh, have knot holes that would be open like a branch would, would break off or fall off. And as long as the opening was about that, you know, 13 to 14 to 15 inches across, then they would be able to get into it because they don't dip their, or they don't pull their wings in like most birds do uh, because their wings aren't actually made that way. They, even when we watch them go into chimneys and I'll have a little video here, you'll see that they enter with their wings fully spread out. So that's why when you build a, a tower, you wanna make sure that the opening at the top is wide enough so that they can actually get into it. Uh, potential nest sites have now, now can come from deceased ash trees, especially the larger ones. And then again, standing dead trees can be nesting or roosting sites. Uh, keep them upright as possible. Keep them upright if possible. Uh, some people actually, when they have a dead tree or a, a tree that has died and it's hollow in the middle, they actually move that tree out of the woods and place it 
in more of an open area and use that as a chimney swift tower. So the chimney swift in Ohio was very, very important. Um, Dr. Ralph Dexter, who was the noted professor of biology at Kent State University for years, studied the chimney swifts extensively on the campus and in, in downtown Kent. And they honored all the work that he had done by placing the chimney swift on the Kent State University seal. There's Dr. Dexter there. They would find a lot of them in these um, air vents that were on the sides of the buildings. And so he would be able to do a lot of his banding work and research work. Uh, I, several times I've, when I've given this talk, I've actually met with people who said they were students of Dr. Dexter and were, part, were able to participate in his banding work and just absolutely loved it. Um, so think about as they come back into Ohio for migration so far, our earliest uh, Swift entering Ohio during the northward migration appeared in Marietta on March 3rd of 1973. And then our late date for southern migration was a flock of 12 birds that were observed in the Dayton area on November 10th. So keep in mind those dates are probably going to fall and you know that span be spread further apart because of how our climate has changed so much over the years. But uh, now we're trying to encourage people to just keep an eye on what they're seeing and when they're seeing them during the both northward and southward migrations to see how much that might be changing. Uh, the oldest chimney swift on record was 14 and a half years when it was captured by an Ohio bird bander in 1970. So the city of Kent being sort of the, the home of Dr. Dexter, they now have gone in, they had a police station that had a, uh, a chimney on it and they actually took that down and they had swifts in that chimney. So the engineer got together with some plans and they have now erected this fantastic tower that, that sits off of uh, not far from the university and not far from sort of the center, center roads in Kent. And those tiles that you see on the side were done by local artists that have different um, insects and chimney swifts on them. So they've, they've done a beautiful job with it. So hopefully the swifts will find it soon and use it, but it's, it's quite the uh, sort of the high end of the towers that are being built now. So looking at other structures that the swifts can use, they use chimneys, silos, wells, cisterns, air vents, outhouses, and other man-made structures. They do prefer sites with low light. So the taller the structure, the more likely the swifts will then use them because, because of the low light that tends to be further down in interior to the structure. The nest construction begins during the last half of May and continues through mid-June. Both parents help build the nest. But despite how many birds may come and go in the structure, whether they're just roosting there for, for a night or as they're migrating and they're sort of uh, hop, skip and a jump to their area where they want to end up being, they there is only one active nest in any structure, regardless of the size of the structure. So in that lower left, when you see that big barn silo, uh, birds may use that as they're migrating, but there's only going to be one nest in there. And the birds will defend their territory in there to keep other potential swifts from nesting because that's their spot. So they make their their nest out of it's sort of like a half a cup of short dead twigs that they break off while they are in flight. And so what they will do is they will make several passes over a potential dead tree that might have good material for them to build. And as you can see in that lower left, they fly over that tree. The red arrow is pointing to the stick that is in the bill that he's trying to break off from the tree. The purple oval that you see there, birds have been observed flying at the tree, taking their, their feet and breaking that bill and then transferring that stick to their, transferring the stick from their feet to their bill where the, you can see the yellow arrow. And then they use the saliva that is actually generated during the time that they are actually nest building. So they have a little pouch in below their bill that fills with this 
a saliva type fluid that's like a glue. And then each time they go to attach the stick, they will use that saliva to put it in place. And then you can see the photo on the lower right where it ends up just continually adding the sticks to this vertical surface. So you can see in the left picture that, that um, cement, that glue-like saliva as it dries, it kind of looks like a clear looking little spider web feature there, but that's actually the, uh, the saliva. And again, the saliva will harden with air exposure. So a lot of times they tend to build their nests or start building their nests in the afternoon to use either the sun exposure or the higher heat for drying that to help keep those sticks in the arrangement that they want them. Uh, they will continue to add sticks to, net, to the nest while they're laying eggs. And they can use nests from year to year. They may go back into a lot of times when they come back to their area where they're going to nest, especially if they have had a successful nesting the prior years, they may use that nest again and just add new sticks to where there might be some damage or some sticks may have fallen out over the winter. But you can see how even though the nest is small, once those eggs get in there and those birds actually start to grow, it's a tight fit. Those nests are not very big. And you can see that to the picture on the lower right, that sort of yellowish wash that you see on the side, that's all part of the saliva that was used because if you notice on the nest on the left, they swing up the edges or the rounding of the edges of the nest up high to add a greater surface area to allow that nest to adhere better to the vertical surface. So as I mentioned, the saliva is only available during the time of nest building, but then they reduce in size. And then those pouches are used to carry the insect balls, which they will carry back to feed the young. So it's not like they take one mosquito and bring it back to the nest and feed a baby or one, you know, wh whatever other flying insect. They actually will gather several as they are flying and then they will put them all in this pouch and make of this little insect ball. And then they will deposit that insect ball into the open gaping mouth of the youngster as they beg for the food. So when the nest is completed, they measure about two to three inches front to back. So meaning from the wall or from the vertical surface outward, it's about four inches wide and about an inch to two inches deep. So again, not a big nest. And again, you can see on the right-hand side where that wash of sort of a varnish looking wash that is all part of the, the glue, the saliva glue that is used to help bring the edges of the nest up higher to add stability to that. Now they can lay anywhere from three to seven white eggs, typically four or five. The female deposits an egg every eight hours or so while continuing to add sticks to the nest. And then they incubate from about 18 to 21 days and both parents will sit on the, on the nest, on the eggs. And as you notice, a lot of these photos are showing different surfaces where these nests are being attached. So while they're inside of a chimney or inside of a silo or inside of some, some man-made feature in most cases, I've yet to find chimney swifts nesting in a dead tree. That's one of my bucket list items. I've never seen it and I've always looked. So hopefully one day I will get to see that. But you can see how the rougher the interior is to the structure, the more desirable the, that area would be for nesting. So in that lower left picture, you can see that that's an old time chimney that is made out of stones that were you know, stacked up. It's not, not a brick feature, but then on the right, you can see where the swift has built the nest right on the interior, right on the bricks. So when the when people make their chimney swift towers, it is recommended that they use like a rough sawn plywood or something like that on the interior so that so that the swifts can adhere their little sticks. So they are single brooded, meaning one nest per season per year. Uh, both parents feed the young on the average of every 30 minutes until they're about four days old. And then after that, they're feeding them hourly. Bugs, bugs, bugs. And really, it's amazing uh, how much they will take. I know that before I had my tower uh, up and operational to where the birds were using it, 
it was very tough to go in the backyard and walk around because you would just be you know, assaulted by mosquitoes. Now, basically, it is mosquito free from the time the swifts come out in the morning to the time they go, be go back to bed at night. And it's amazing. Once they go to bed, then, then the mosquitoes are out and there's really not much in the way of predators other than maybe some bats, but we know how low we are on our bat population. So at about 10 days, the wing feathers begin to unfurl. And at 14 days, the eyes begin to open. So you can see Greg's photo on the left where you can see the actual little stalks of the feathers that are forming on those cute little pink bodies. And then in the lower right, that's one of the shots I was able to take looking down into my, my tower. And you can sort of look for the, the bills or the eyes to see how many young are in there. So there's one there and there's one there, and another one here. Um, typically I'm getting anywhere from five to six eggs in my two towers that I have now, which has been really great. And then the young outgrow the nest after about two weeks. And so you can see there, look at the nest on the left compared to the size of the birds on the right. They will then hang vertically. Uh, and sometimes they're already out of the nest before their eyes are open and hanging vertically next to the nest because they just can't fit. Uh, notice where, if you look at where the long wings are overlapping each other, uh, that's something I'll talk about later about the distance of that overlap and how important it is to the time when they start to leave the nest and start to fly. So here's a video here that I wanna show you. And this is where the female is obviously on the nest. And then you can see how she's you know, feeding them the insects. They do not carry out fecal pellets. They just basically drop them over the side and they fall into the base of the chimney or the base of the tower, whatever structure they might be in. But when she first approached the nest, you notice how she came up the side and she used her feet to sort of ladder her way up there. And again, as the first ones are born, they're gonna get you know, the beginning parts of the uh, food and the younger ones kind of have to wait in line, but it's great to be able to look inside and watch, you know, watch them being fed. Okay, let's, and then she'll just sit back down on them and do her thing, or him, <laughs> could be, could be the dad, because they both will feed. All right, whoops, let's go off of that. Okay, so now as fledglings, at 20 days, the eyes have turned black. They are blue when they're born. They will practice flapping by holding tightly to the nest or to the wall and exercising their wings until basically they're out of breath. And it really does happen that way. So that upper left photo, that's one of mine looking down into my tower. You can see the older one here on the left, another one here on the right, and then another one back behind and below the nest. If you look further down into that, you can see a bunch of little white things down there. Those are, you know, fecal pellets. And as they get older, it's actually, uh, you know, the, the bird droppings that are in there. Um, I do clean out the bottoms of the the towers, but after the first three or four years, when I went to clean it out, there was less than, say, a quarter of an inch of the, that substance on the bottom. So then if you look at the lower left, you can see how there they are flying up and down in the chimney, exercising their wings, and they're not really out yet. They're still practicing at this point. And then again, you can see on the photo on the right, I believe this was a group of swifts that had been rescued and they are being kept in an area where the surface is nice and rough vertically and then being fed so that they can be released. So as fledglings, so after about a month, 28 to 30 days, they take their first flight outside the chimney, leaving the nest. Once the entire brood has fledged, they will fly with their parents in slow, noisy parades around the area of the nest site with the young frequently returning to the site, roost site during the first few days. So a lot of times if you've got them nesting 
in you know one of your towers or in your chimney you can actually watch them come out as a family and stay together as a family constantly making that little chittering noise because it's directions being given to the young and teaching them how to fly and swoop and do all their dives and everything and then after that they can visit other roost sites or other chimney sites in the area uh, I usually when I'm when I'm home and able to do it, I will sit outside at night when they go into my towers and I'll make a note of when they go in. Sometimes when they go in, they come back out again and how many go in for the night. Basically, once it gets to be dark, they're in for the night and they are not back out again until the morning. However, if they get startled, like something bumps up against the chimney or the tower, uh, they will come out even though it's dark and they will wait a bit to see that everything is okay and then they will go back in. So for feeding, they feed almost entirely on flying insects but can take small larvae, ballooning spiders and caterpillars hanging from leaves or branches. They consume mayflies, mosquitoes, flies, midges, bugs, bees, wasps and more and they can eat more than five to 6,000 insects per day. They take larger insects with their bills and smaller insects go right down their throat. They eat nearly a third of their weight in flying insects each day. Mosquitoes, biting flies, that means thousands of mosquito sized insects are consumed daily. So keep in mind they have done, you know, stomach content studies and by far and away they have found that mosquitoes and some of the other um, insects about the size of mosquitoes are their main prey item but looking across here you can see this upper right photo is showing you how a group is being fed mealworms uh, obviously they are being rehabbed so they can be released but here's our spider on the left and crane flies mosquitoes and then sometimes you'll see those little hanging caterpillars that might be hanging from their own little thread as they are dropped out of the trees and the birds can actually take those as well so let's talk about their migration and their courtship. So basically they go down to the blue area in the northwestern part of South America, the upper Amazon basin, Peru, Chile, Brazil, and Ecuador. And basically these are this species of birds was one of the last birds where they discovered where their area of winter migration, where they ended up. And it was done like in the mid 40s. And how they discovered it was there was a group of uh, scientists and such that were putting little copper wires on their legs as leg bands. And because they really didn't know where they went, there was always a thought that they would get to the Gulf of Mexico and then just fly into the water and perish because where else were they gonna go? And of course they didn't really know, but some of the native peoples in that blue area that you see in the South American map, they capture birds and they eat birds a lot. So what they would do is they would light fires under uh, dead and dying trees that had an open center to them. And they would light the fires in that open center of the tree. And as the birds basically smoking the birds out that were roosting for the night in those hollowed out trees. And they ended up actually smoking out these chimney swifts and they picked them up and they noticed that they had these copper bands on their legs so they actually took it to a nearby church and as it the information got back up to uh, the northeast part of the united states where they then discovered that here's where the birds were going because the birds were being found with these copper wire leg bands so it's quite the uh quite the revelation, but it did. It took, it took to the mid forties to discern that or figure that out. They are migrating 10,000 miles each year. Remember, if you look at the red area, that's where they are a breeding resident. So those groups that come down from, you know, the Southern part of Canada, they've got obviously a further distance to fly. So again, that's a long flight knowing that they do not migrate during the night. So they have to stop along the way at dusk and such and get into a, a, a chimney or a tower or a dead tree or whatever uh, in order to use that to roost for the night. And then when the morning comes, they're back up again and flying again. So as you look at the map on the left, you will see that the yellow areas, at first they thought that 
They might be flying over the Gulf of Mexico, but they do know depending on when they start their journey and what time of day it is once they get to a bigger body of water, that then they will go around uh, and into Mexico or into Cuba so that they are not trying to fly over the Gulf at night, which is not their favorite thing to do. Uh, again, in Ohio, our first migrants start to return by the first week of April. But if we have a lot of cold spring temperatures, it may delay their arrival till mid-April or even late April. Most have arrived back in Northeast Ohio between April 25th and May 15th. Once they get to their area, especially if they are returning to the area where they had a successful nesting uh, site for the previous year or years, they will perform aerial courtship displays within two weeks arriving at their chosen breeding areas. They do form monogamous pairs for the breeding season, but then if something happens to one of them, then you know that changes, obviously. Their southward migration normally peaks during September and the first week of October, and most of them are gone by the last week of October. So even though your resident Swifts may leave say in the early part of September, or even some people notice them leaving at the end of August, uh, notice that you will still be seeing Swifts as other individuals and groups come down from higher latitude areas. So you might be seeing Swifts doing their migratory flight for more than just a short period of time. So for their flight and roosting, they basically spend virtually all their daylight hours on the wing, except when they are on the nest or maybe during a really bad storm, they may go back into their structure to hang out until that passes. They rank among the strongest of all flyers. And again, they've clocked speeds in excess of 120 miles an hour. But again, they are incapable of taking off from tree branches or wires, but they can do so from the ground. So if, some, if one falls off of a structure and it's on the ground, it actually does this very awkward hopping motion to get to a vertical surface to try to use the, their claws to climb up and be able to leave from that vertical position. Uh, those people that, that then do rehabbing on swifts, they put them on vertical logs, tr sides of tree trunks and things like that so that they are able to fly. If you look at the photo on the left, you can see those little tail spines and then you can see the, the claws on the feet and how uh, how important it is for them to be able to hang on in that way. But just look at the length and the narrowness of the wings when they're at rest. It's very impressive, which is one of the reasons why they can fly so fast. So most of them roost by hanging on to vertical surfaces. And here are some photos looking down into these larger chimneys. Uh, again, you can see how they're all sort of lined up in different areas. They don't necessarily go way, way down into the chimney when they roost. And if you look at the picture on the upper right, you can see how they're all sort of massed in a, in a group at a certain distance down. Part of that has to do with the amount of light that can enter into the chimney. So the taller the chimney, uh, the more uh, positional areas that they have for actually doing their roosting, the shallower or shorter the chimney, it may obviously then makes a difference. So you can see in the lower lower right picture where you're looking into another one of those chimneys that can either be brick or ceramic or something like that. And usually these are older ones that they have been using for years and years and years. They will congregate in flocks of hundreds and even thousands at suitable roost sites, especially during migration. So the evening descents into the chimneys, the Birds first start to gather about an hour before sunset. And first you'll start seeing scattered individuals enter and then they may come back out. And then as it gets darker, larger groups will drop into the structure. And then within minutes, most of them have entered the roost site, typically these chimneys. And then you do have these little late stragglers. They will enter quietly as single individuals as it gets darker. Sometimes you will see, and it's reported to be that they're sort of these sentry swifts that are on the outer lip or the outer edges of the actual group that is roosting inside of that. And if they sort of feel that the chimney is, is full up, they may chase those stragglers 
to another site or, or chase them out of there. Uh, again, largest flocks that you most commonly see form during the spring and fall migration. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to attend the Midwest Native Plant Conference, which takes place down in the Dayton area. And we are at a site that has a wonderful old uh, 1940s age uh, brick chimney that's nice and tall. And we get to go out and watch these swifts come in at night. And people that have never seen them before are always really amazed at how, how they will all fly into that chimney in these sort of sequences that you see there. So here is another video. I'm just going to warn you about the dramatic music that will start when it starts to play. So, but this is exactly how they go into the chimneys and to bigger areas as night starts to fall. Watch their wings, how they are not tucking them at all. Their wings are totally open. And obviously they turn them in different directions so they can settle down into the chimney. And they never bump into each other there. You know, it's just amazing, especially with so many going in. These next several shots, you can see how, again, the wings are never drawn in. They're totally open. So the larger the opening, you know, makes it easier for them to be able to go into that opening. Even when you build a tower, uh, we're learning more about making the openings larger because there is some thought as to the fact that our birds up here in the northern part of their range actually have a little larger wingspan than those down in the Texas area, which was part of what Paul and Georgie and Kyle started when they started to erect their first towers. So now there's some um, addition, additions being added to their plans to make that opening larger. And we'll talk more about that here in a, in a bit. So again, the, the status and the conservation, it's quite the dire set of circumstances. Uh, the population has been declining since the mid 60s. The IUCN has it uh, labeled as a species that is near threatened. Uh, the North American Breeding Bird Survey uh, lists that they are in a long-term range-wide decline of about 2.2% per year from the mid 60s to 2010, but now we're seeing them drop even more. Uh, this is a cumulative decline of 65%. And then the 2014 State of Birds Report lists them as a common bird in steep decline. So if you look at the Ohio BBS graph for the chimney swifts, uh, so the numbers on the where you see annual index or on the y-axis, since there were a lot of chimney swifts back, uh, back in the day, you can see how the numbers start up higher to the 30, 35, 40. But then the, the decline is really rapidly being noticed. So if you look at the time that the first breeding bird atlas was done compared to the time when the second breeding bird atlas was done, you can see that that is quite the decline. And I wanna thank Matt for giving me the latest update on on this graph and, and he can talk more about that because this is this is all the great stuff that, that he does at OBCI. But just notice how a lot of that decline has taken place, you know, over the last like, you know, since 1990. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, Matt, did you want to add anything here while the graph is up? Uh, you're covering it really well, um, Judy. Um, yeah, probably the big thing there, you can you actually see a, a bit of an increase probably from the mid 1970s into the 1990s. Um, some of that was probably from um, urbanization or sprawl, but building designs at the time were such that they likely created some habitat for chimney swifts. Um, and then as we see a, a change in uh, building codes and, and and the way that we're making chimneys, which Judy's going to go into great detail about, that's that's where we start to see that decline. It's it's pretty it's pretty dramatic uh, since the 1970s um, or 1990, excuse me. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so 
There are many reasons for the decline, but a lot of them have to do with, like Matt said, is, is how we are building our new buildings, our new homes and things like that. And because now most, if not all of the insurance companies will not uh, do homeowners policy on open fireplaces like the homes used to have, uh, they are now either ones with a an insert in them to where then they go to these uh, metal flu pipes that come out of the side of the house. And of course, that is not a good a site for chimney swifts to try to nest in. They can't grip onto the metal. The openings are not large enough for them to get into, even though if they're not capped, some swifts do try to get into them because they are vertical. But again, it's too slick. So make sure that anytime you see these or have these types of chimneys and then flue pipes that they always have a cover to them to you know, discourage the swifts from trying to get into them. Other things that were very important to the swifts, and as we talked about having these chimneys that were built onto homes and they had a large enough opening for the swifts to get into, many of them now are being covered or wire being put over them. And it's because a lot of times it's the chimney sweeps that actually put the coverings over the holes of very viable and good nesting sites for the swifts because they sort of convince people that the noise they might be hearing are raccoons or squirrels, which they can be. And we'll talk about how we can keep that from happening. But the three chimneys that you see on the left, those would all be very good chimneys for swifts to be able to use. But unfortunately, they cannot use them because they're covered. Now, we've seen a big sort of push to these outdoor chimneys for these uh, cooking uh, areas where either people are using them to cook on or they're using them just for putting a little fire in there and sitting around them as their patio. But even though they're shorter, if they're open at the top, as you see on the two photos on the right, uh, make sure those get covered because you will then be using them to have live open fires during the time when the swifts might be nesting. <clears throat> and that can be a real problem, obviously, for the nests to have that fire below them. So even though they are shorter, they actually can, you know, can be used. The swifts will try to get interior to them. And of course, if they're lined with, you know, fire brick or something like that, they certainly can cling to it and potentially, you know, try to make a nest. Also, the deterioration and then the demolition of traditional brick chimneys, especially these big, large ones. And again, back in the day, we were really using our furnaces in that during the winter months when the Swifts were down in South America. So it wasn't so much of a problem that once they came back, uh, most of the chimneys that had a furnace that was attached to the chimney, those chimneys had three openings to them. One was for the furnace. One was for back in the day, the incinerators that were used to burn the garbage. And then the third one was actually capped because people thought it looked more regal if you had a wider chimney that had more than one or two openings to them. So demolition of old factories or schools or churches, which typically had the preferred chimney structures for the Swifts uh, because they either were using them for coal fires or uh, you know, regular furnace type heat as those came into the heating units that were then popular. Because the Swifts are solitary nesters, each and every suitable nest site is critical. And even if the structure is abandoned, if the chimney could be left, even if it has holes in it, like you see the one on the right, the Swifts can absolutely get in there and use them. And every nesting site becomes extremely precious to them. Nuisance predators can invade the chimneys and tamper with swift nest sites, raccoons and squirrels, which then prompted owners to cap the chimneys. But you can actually go into your chimney. If you have a masonry chimney, you could actually go into that chimney. And at the top, if, you, if it's capped, you can take that cap off and wrap. If you see the circle in the lower right, you wrap like a two foot high metal wrap across, around the top of that chimney. That way the squirrels and the chipmunk, I mean the uh, raccoons can't get a grip on, those, on that metal wrap and can't get into it. Now, if the chimneys are covered over by trees and the squirrels, you know, get down into them, that's different. 
and then you may want to cap them. But again, if it's something that you can keep the nuisance predators or the nuisance animals out of there, that could be a, a wonderful site for a chimney swift nest. Also, more, more to the point, especially now, for the population declines is our decrease in flying insect numbers and their populations as a result of you know, the chemical usage of herbicides, pesticides, uh, invasive species that are limiting host plants for pollinators and other flying insects, and then farming practices, which include planting to the very edges uh, of fields, and then the usage of neonics and other unfriendly insect products and more. So keep in mind that when you have areas that are being sprayed across the board, like the lower left picture where they're spraying these fields while the, you know, while their crops are growing, any of the insects that fly into the not only the spray, but as that spray goes upward and gets, you know, distributed even by the wind, then you're basically having a swift eating an insect that might be coated in a chemical. Not good. Same thing with the um, people that live in areas where they do bring the trucks down and, and do this big mosquito spraying like you see on the lower right. That's a huge, huge problem, not only for the insects, but for the swifts, because there are a little higher on the food chain. And if the insects are getting coated or, you know, getting any kind of these chemicals on them, then again, that becomes, you know, assimilated into the body of the swifts. Um, where I live up here in Northeastern Ohio, I keep trying to get municipalities to put up actual swift towers so that they don't have the insect population. And instead of spraying for the mosquitoes that perhaps trying to use the real method of having the, you know, the birds being the predators for them is a much better way of doing it because as we all know, those chemicals get into our soil, then they get into our water system and we're, we're actually poisoning ourselves as well and our pets and, and our children and grandchildren that are using the areas that those places get sprayed. I like this little um, description here with the, with the uh, all the things that we kind of do in our area. Our decrease in flying insect numbers and our populations are a result of using neonics and un other unfriendly insect products. And again, so our swifts and our swallows and anything else that's in these areas where these things are being used really can feel these negative effects. So as the neonics are sprayed on the crops or injected into trees or, or coated onto seeds and then those get planted, uh, the neonics and the seed coatings spread, spread through the plant, which then end up being in the soil. The seed fragments, the dust and the sprays that spread the neonics into the soil, which then ends up, again, going down into the soil, going into our wetlands, going into, you know, just as everything does, uh, the bees can pick up the neonics from the pollen and the nectar because the plant roots can uptake it. It can be on the leaves. And then again, any of the birds that are nesting in these trees that, that get sprayed, it's all part of this basic poisoning that affects much more than just us and the crops because there are just so many other species, natural species that are using it and then of course getting affected by it. So avoid using pesticides and herbicides if at all possible. So how can you help? Well, if you do have your chimneys clean, have them clean before the swifts return here uh, from South America. So basically after November and before March would be the best time, you know, to have them be cleaned. Uh, the key, keep masonry clay flue tile chimneys open at the top. Avoid antennas, TV dishes, or low overhanging tree branches or other obstructions. Clearance of 12 inches or more is acceptable. So if you look at the lower right picture, you will see a chimney that has a stone cap to it. But that distance where the arrow is pointing is more than 12 inches. So the swifts can still fly into that chimney and use it. You want to keep the damper closed. So if you have the type of chimney that has a damper in it, look at the yellow circle in the middle in that drawing. The damper is that little door that you open and close when you either have a fire or don't have a fire. But at the time that the swifts are here, keep the damper closed. So if the young birds should fall out of the nest, as you see in the upper left photo, 
they actually can fall down into the fireplace, which is then interior to the house. And believe it or not, the parents are really great. They will go, they will creep right down there with it. And that picture is showing the adult with a youngster that then were rescued and taken to a rehab place until that young one was big enough to be able to fly. But again, keeping that, that damper closed will help the Swifts to stay in that upper cylindrical part of the chimney. So if one does fall out and ends up down near the bottom there with the damper closed, then it can use its claws to climb up the brick to get back up to where it needs to be. And the parent will you know, be a very good parent and hang with them. So the best case scenario is kind of that lower left picture where you see the open chimney that's got a nice big opening to it, which allows the Swifts to get in there with their big, you know, with their open wings at the 13 to 14 inches. And then again, um, chimney sweeps are supposed to know that, you know, chimney swifts are a migratory bird, they are protected, but some of them don't. And some of them actually, if you look at ads for chimney sweeps, um, they will tell you, you know, about they'll come out and take that noise out of your chimney. Remember that these birds are only making noise for about two weeks that you might be hearing them because you're hearing the begging of the babies calling. Now a lot of the sophistication of the cleaning of the chimneys is what you see in the lower left. They go up on this little crane type structure and they send these tubes down that have very high pressure air that's forced down in there. Sometimes they even put an abrasive material in there that scrubs the interior of the chimney, which again would then take off any nests or obviously doing it during the time when the younger in there is not the way to go. It is federal law to you know destroy the nests. The old time sweeps that would use the brushes, uh, those also obviously cause damage. So basically the word is here is time of year clean them after the Swiss have left and before they come back. So October to February, but we may find that as time goes on, it might be more like November to February or November to January, because as the temperatures stay warmer for longer, their migratory patterns may change. Save old chimneys whenever possible. Many of our old downtowns have chimneys attached to historic buildings. Even if the building must be raised, try to save the chimneys. Uh, work with local historical societies to preserve these historic structures, even if it's just the chimney. Swifts will return to the same chimney or structure each year, especially as I said before, if they have, you know, a good, if they had a, a positive nesting experience. If that chimney is gone, when they come back to the area, then they must find a new structure. Uh, the same thing is they know where they stop as they're migrating back southward and northward as well. So those that have done it several times know that when they get to a certain point, there should be a chimney there waiting for them that they have used over the years. When those chimneys are gone and it's nighttime or, or it's approaching nighttime and they need to find a place to do their roosting, then hopefully there will be an alternative area for them to select. A lot of our old churches uh, also have and old schools, but unfortunately, a lot of our old schools are getting, you know, demolished and the new schools that they're putting up do not have any type of structure that would even remotely be appealing to chimney swifts. So I work a lot with uh, groups that know of old schools that might be being torn down in their area and we try to work with the school system or whoever owns the property that if the chimney can be kept and not be a danger to any anything or anyone that hopefully that would be a good thing or potentially work a new tower or a new chimney into a new school building so that it is specifically for the Swifts. So action now, construct a chimney swift tower on public or private property, consider your own property, which will help to control the mosquito and biting insect populations without using chemicals. Think retirement centers, municipal sites, schools, libraries, parks, uh, to help the local chimney swift population and even organize a swift watching community event. So you can see here where there's a tower erected in a, in a park setting there in the middle center middle where you see a new tower was put next to uh, a, a chimney that was being used 
And that can be one of the most desirable ways or places to place a new tower. If you know of a chimney that the Swifts are using and you want to put up a tower, then put, you can put it within 10 to 20 feet of an existing chimney or tower. Because when those young fledge and they come back the next year or the year after that, they're going to need to find a chimney of their own to be able to mate and, and have their young. So putting Putting towers near existing sites that already have swifts can be probably the best way to start a new tower area. The lower left, you see a group that's installing a tower. And then on the lower right, you can see where uh, folks gather at a school where there's a very large chimney and they are basically doing swift watching. And when you have a chimney of that size, boy, you can really see the numbers, especially during migration. Um, a lot of our scout groups are starting to work on Chimney Swift Towers as a project. And this group that I worked with in Oberlin, these girls were awesome. They all learned how to use power tools with their with the parents that helped them out. And they actually erected this in a site that's being protected there at the uh, Oberlin Prairie. So this can all be something that um, adults as well as kids can get involved in. Uh, we do have some communities now that are being quite proactive that if a chimney needs to be replaced or they're putting in new buildings, they're actually putting in chimneys or, or structures just for the Swifts. And so if one gets demolished and you're going to put up another one, try to keep it as close to the original structure as possible, because when those Swifts come back and want to use the old one and it's not there, then they can try to use, you know, move into the new one. Uh, many of the fire departments are very helpful in helping to either put together a chimney or help ra raise a chimney up with their uh, ladder trucks. And that's been something that's been used by several um, municipalities. The lower right shows a chimney swift tower that was erected and then a kiosk was actually made out of it. So there's a little um, roof put over it with um, good material that's listed about the Swifts, but that's actually a tower that you can't see the top of it made out of stone. So the inside of the structure is nice and rough where the Swifts can attach their, uh, attach their nests. Uh, the, the picture that you see on the left is a tower that was added to a new construction. And you can see all those little black dots are all Swifts that go in at night to use that that little that tower and it's not a little tower, which is great. Uh, again, contacting community leaders to maybe even require chimney swift towers or chimneys being added to new construction of businesses because it's very important and can be important to really cut down on the amount of you know pesticides that are being used for the mosquitoes if you could have a whole series of chimney swift towers or chimneys so that the birds can use them and then eat the bugs that we don't really want to have. Uh, a lot of the new neighborhoods during the 80s and 90s and even into the 2000s were um, allotted areas for green space, which was, you know, a great invention basically to these areas that were, you know, built very closely together with homes. It would be great if we could sort of do the same thing with chimney swift towers and and have them be part of communities or new neighborhoods being uh, being put together. So the tower design and placement can be very important. You want your minimum height of eight to 10 feet, mainly because it provides protection from the direct sunlight toward the interior of the tower, keeps it dark inside. Um, you can, the placement, of where you actually put the tower can be very important. And like I said earlier, a lot of times if you're erecting one that was near to a chimney or a tower that is currently or was currently being used, that can be one that actually gets residents more quickly. Uh, as you can see in the lower right, there's a uh, chimney that was created in the middle of that little uh, descriptive area that had important signage around it. It's important too when you erect your 
tower or your chimney that the base of it is protected so that say you put it in a park and the and the people that go in and mow or do uh, trimming and things around it don't hit or disturb it so a lot of times it's good to put it where there are plantings around it or put a bigger cement base to it so that a mower or something like that can't you know bash into it you can check with your zoning laws to see like in the lower left where you can actually put one right up against your house and even make it blend into the house so it looks similar to your structure uh, the middle one, lower middle, you can see how, again, in a municipal area where they erected one near a building so that it wouldn't get damaged at the base. And then again, in the upper middle, you can see there's another one that was built for the Swifts, but made into a kiosk with good information on the boards around it. Um, you want the interior to be a minimum of 16 inches that accommodates the wingspan and gives them the ability for the movement of the young as they're going up and down when they're learning to become flyers or learning how to use their wings. You want that heavy texture on the inside so that their claws can grip. And then you can see in the lower left picture, the top or the opening at the top of the tower is offset so that you'll notice that the swift nest is placed underneath the area that sort of has a little bit of a roof to it. That helps to keep the inclement weather from dripping right down on top of the swift nest. And when uh, the tower, one of the towers that I had was taken down so that my barn could be uh, recited, the nests that were in there, which were three of them that had been built over a period of about 12 years, uh, all of them were built on the wall that was underneath that little overhang. So that can be very important. And that's part of the plans to have that opening be offset and not take up the entire opening you know, of the structure. You wanna use that 24 inch band of metal flashing around the top to discourage predators from climbing into the tower, uh, climbing up the side of it, such as squirrels or even you know, snakes anything like that, raccoons, we know how, how easily raccoons can climb. And then you can look at the upper left and the lower right and see how that opening, again, that rectangle is offset to the entire opening of the, of the tower. Small towers from eight to 12 feet tall with a 14 to 18 inch inside diameter are suitable as used for nest sites anything that's larger, 15 feet to 40 feet tall or taller, are more likely to be used as roosts by a substantial number of non-breeding and migratory swifts as they come into an area. Uh, I like this one, the, I put this picture in at the bottom because I liked how they added the little dots for the swifts, but those are not swifts in the background. They look more like a, like a murmuration of starlings. But again, putting up a, a masonry type tower that's larger. Anytime any of the towers are built, you want to be able to get into the bottom so that over the years you can empty out uh, the fecal material and that that is dried at the bottom of the tower. So this is something that I learned by having mine. This is my tower attached to the side of my barn. When it was first put up, it was not sided in anything. It was just a uh, T111, unfortunately, in the barn started to decay on the outside of it. But that first tower was put up uh, probably now 12 years. And like I said, I could put a ladder up against it. I could climb up on the roof. I could look down into that opening and see what the Swifts were doing. But then several years ago, I put up my rain barrels, which you can see in the lower left. And I have my downspouts going into the rain barrels and I just switched the opening of the downspout to fill the barrels as needed. But as I was doing that, I was noticing that my gray tree frogs were actually laying eggs inside of my rain barrels. So I stopped putting the mesh screen that you see in the middle there on top of the rain barrels during the day, because what I was noticing that 
at night before the Swifts would go into the tower, they would actually fly over the rain barrels and eat the mosquitoes as they were flying up out of the water of the rain barrels. So they were getting a last, last meal before, before nighttime. But I also noticed that by having the gray tree frogs in there, the gray tree frogs would sit on the edges of the barrels and also eat the mosquitoes that would come up out of the barrel. So that's something to consider. I felt like I was giving a food source to my swifts that were not getting any type of chemicals. Um, I'm too far from the road really when they run the, the truck with the spray on it in the fall for the mosquitoes. I always hated the fact that the, that the birds were you know, eating those tainted um, little bugs. So this actually works really well with the setup that I have. And then he, at night, I either put the screen back on or I don't at all. And I let the bats get the mosquitoes then that are you know, hatching out of the water. So if you have one tower, then you need to have two. So uh, two years ago, when the barn got recited, uh, I had the guys make a second tower exactly the same. So you see it there on the right. They are about 20 feet apart and they put it up in November and the next spring, there was a new pair of birds in there. So the tower on the left had a nest of six birds and the tower on the right had a nest of five birds or five, uh, five young, five eggs. So from that point on, these towers have been used once they determined they found them and and got busy using them they have been used every year so it's been just a delight for me because i just love these birds but it's also been a great source of uh, you know watching and writing down what they're doing where they're hunting things like that and i've really learned a lot about the swifts by watching my own swifts so again basic tower designs that you see at the on the right hand side is about a six to eight hundred dollar amount depending on the cost of materials you can see that they're on these little um, sort of rebar looking legs and they are cemented into the ground if you're putting them in an open area where they aren't being attached to any other structure you can uh, build them in sections like you see on the upper left and then one section will fit over top. And that's actually how the tower uh, on the right can be built also. And then you can side or put anything on the outside to cover up the sections. But by having them up on the legs like that, there is a piece of wood at the bottom of the tower that you can remove in order to empty it out. It has air holes in it so that that's part of the airflow that goes through. And if those, you know, the rain or whatever gets in at the end of the season, I put a piece of slate on top of my openings just so that it keeps the, the, the winter weather out of the interior. And then again, the tower that you see on the left that's obviously made out of brick has, a, has an opening, a little door on the left side that can then be opened to, you know, clean out the, the bottom of it. So the, what does the tower mean to the Swifts? Well, when the Swifts accept the tower, it becomes a nesting site for the young and so much more. Uh, it's a nightly roost throughout spring, summer, and fall for that family. Uh, it can also be a nightly roost for the young from the previous year. We've also noticed that the young of the previous year can help to feed the young of the current year. So they can be helpful if they're not uh, sexually mature enough to be ready to start their own family they can still be found near the place where they were born. It is a refuge from inclement weather, and it is a safe place to rest during intense summer heat or when flying insect food might be scarce. It's really only the bird's terrestrial contact because as the, the chimney or the, or the uh, tower is attached to the ground, then that is then the attachment when they say terrestrial contact. An occupied tower will become a home to the resident birds during their entire six to seven month stay in the area. So this was uh, something down where I live in Stark County, uh, the Summer Wildlife Conservation Center at Sippo Lake has this great group of people that work there, including these volunteers. And right around the 4th of July is when they typically get the birds that need to be rehabbed, either they, the nest may have fallen or birds fell out of the nest, but that's when they tend to start to get 
chimney swifts that might need some rehabbing. So they built this box that you see the girl is feeding little swifts inside of that box. They, they lay towels in there so that the, bait, the young birds can grip onto those towels. They cover it when they're not feeding it, feeding the birds so that it's dark inside. And so that's their structure that they feed from. So I was invited to come out to take a look at a group that they had in. They actually had several ages of birds. So the upper left that you see, uh, there are eight day old chimney swifts. The middle part shows a 19 day old swift on the left next to swifts that are 24 days old. And then the 24 day old swifts are down at the bottom. So Linda Watkins and her staff and her volunteers, they were just, it was amazing to watch their process. They would feed these birds mealworms every 30 minutes uh, until they were eight days old. And then every hour for those that were 24 days old or in between. And if you notice where the green arrow is pointing, I talked about that wing overlap. So when the wing overlap is at least an inch, then they know that the birds are ready to be released because then their wings are long enough for them to sustain their flight as they should in nature. So I was able to, this is a little video of the young doing their vocalization. And they're just getting their little feather rods, but they would put those eight day old ones in this sort of V shaped structure to feed them. And then, here are the 24 day old ones. And you can see the interior of the box. You can see the towels that are on the side and the birds gripping onto the towels. And then their staff would just go right down the line and feed these guys. And they basically would feed them till they you know, weren't taking any, then they would cover them up and the next hour they would go back and feed them again. Uh, they would band all of them, and so what a great process it was, and it was very heartwarming to watch these birds being rescued to the point where they could then be released. <laughs> so there's a lot of activity going on in there. So if you do have a swift problem where one ends up in your house or whatever, think about a local rehab center that can, you know, take them and help them out. Okay, so reasons to aid the chimney swifts. Well, they're just plain cute, but I like this graphic here because it really gives you some good information. They can eat a third of their body weight in insects every day. They have declined by 65% since the mid 60s, but now we know that they're declining even more. That percentage is higher. Um, adjust or remove your chimney swift cap or your chimney cap so that the swifts can get in there. Masonry chimneys can be best, so those older ones from older homes can be a real boon to, you know, additional nesting sites, and then you can build your own chimney swift tower. Uh, Chimneyswift.org, as you see across the bottom there, is one of the best um, sites to get on, but I'll have a whole reference set of pages here at the end. Important reasons to aid area parks, schools, and businesses to help the chimney swifts. Schools can really be a great place for helping the SWIFTS because there's a lot of curriculum information out there now that teachers can use to teach students about, uh, about the SWIFTS. Uh, I've been working with a group out at Champion Schools in Trumbull County and they've put up several towers. They have a whole um, group of information that the kids learn about with their SWIFTS. They're actually putting up more towers as time has gone on. So their science, curriculum has worked really well with teaching the kids about SWIFTS, have SWIFT counting parties during the summer evenings. I've also worked with several groups out in the western part of Ohio, and they've done a great job getting towers up. Some of them have not yet been successful with enticing the SWIFTS to come, but remember in an area where there's never been a tower, it's hard for the birds to find them. So sometimes in these big farming communities, if you have swifts that are using the silos, then you can erect towers near the silos where the young of the ensuing years then might be able to establish a new nest site in a new tower. And then again, um, use the chimney ecosystem for school
school project studies, science, math, art, like I said, there's a lot of curriculum work that can help teachers to help students learn about the SWIFTs. So here is uh, a slide and then Matt can provide this to anyone who needs this information, but the book that you see in the upper left was really the Bible for people that wanted to construct a tower. It's got drawings in it, like you see on the, on the left, showing you all of the sort of the pieces, parts that are being used. But now we're learning in the lower right, they have now issued a secondary uh, set of plans that they've made some adjustments to it. Uh, and this is a, for constructing or building an eight foot uh, freestanding tower. And so that you see the area in yellow, you can go on uh, the chimneyswift.org. You can actually order this. It's like $5 to get this set of plans that now is having a larger opening at the top and making the tower just a little bit broader and wider than their previous plans that were in the blue book. So that's something I highly recommend. Um, there's also people who are taking on their own property, taking a, a dead tree that might be hollow in the center. They're actually taking it down. They're bringing it out of the woods and putting it in an area where the swifts would have more of an ability to get into it. They didn't have, you know, overhanging branches and such weren't there. And so they were using a dead tree with an open interior as a natural area uh, for the swifts to nest. So that also is a way to uh, create a chimney or create a tower. So the last line there that says a chimney swift tower at Spice with Texas, chimneyswift.org. I highly recommend that uh, website. Um, there's also a, um, a Facebook page up here in Northeast Ohio, and I'm sorry I don't have the, the link to it on there, but uh, take a look at that. If you're, I'm not on social media like on Facebook, but take a look at that because there's a lot of good information on there. People ask questions, and so check that out. And then uh, other useful websites and information sources. You can look at um, Cavity Nesting Birds, Birds of Ohio, the Chimney Swift Tower book that I mentioned earlier, uh, chimneyswift.org. Uh, also, anytime you get into the All About Birds or any of that through um, a lot of these really great uh, birding sites, I highly recommend those because the information is very, very good. Um, also then for kids, there's a kid's book called uh, Spit and Sticks. There's also a Wisconsin Chimney Swift working group for teachers. So there's a lot of good information for teachers to help teach kids about SWIFTS. Uh, the newsletter that I show here on the right, the, the white and black Chatura, uh, or Chatura, I've heard people pronounce it both ways. That is the uh, informational newsletter that is published by chimneyswift.org, chimneyswifts.org, and you can actually go online, become a member. You can actually register your tower so that they know where all the towers are across the country, which is kind of a cool thing to, to see where people are, are, you know, setting up these areas. So again, a lot of good information out there that uh, people can use. And then there's a couple of really good podcasts and video programs. Uh, the Nature Guys, which is a, a group of guys down in the southwestern part of Ohio. They have a lot of really good talks that they give. And you can go back and listen to some of the older ones, but they did a podcast on Chimney Swifts a couple of years ago. And then there's YouTube videos on uh, Chimney Swifts. The PBS show on Chimney Swifts was actually uh, in with the paddlefish and other uh, information as well. Again, there's several that do a really good job with actually going through a video, showing you how to actually build a tower or learning more about the swift behavior by videoing uh, towers that are already in place. And then again, this I just love this uh, lithograph from 1865 because it just kind of shows you how these old dead trees can really be a support system for so many different creatures, especially cavity nesting birds and bats. And so when those can be protected or saved and they're not gonna fall on a structure or car or something, uh, that's the thing to do because we really lose a lot of habitat when we take down uh, you know, an old dead tree. And then I did like this, um, 
this line, their twittering notes and whizzing wings create a musical but wild continued roar. The twittering whizzing roar continues to increase. The revolving circle fast assumes a funnel shape moving downward until the point reaches the hollow in the stub, pouring its living mass therein until the last bird dropped out of sight. So that was a, you know, a quote from a Native American. And again, talking about watching swifts going into obviously a dead tree, which I would love to see at some point. So at this time, I am happy to take any questions and will do my best to give you answers. Thanks, Judy. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, Thanks, I'll, I'll open it up now. I, mean, I have some of my own thoughts and questions, but um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, we haven't had any in the Q&A yet. So if you have any questions for Judy, now is your chance. You can either enter them in the Q&A. It looks like we've got one there. Okay, so Bill asks, he says he purchased an old home with two fireplaces and two chimneys. Both chimneys have caps and stainless steel liners in them. Do you know of any cases where people have rehabbed, uh, short of tearing them down and rebuilding them, uh, chimneys like these to make them usable for swifts again? That's a really great question. I do know of uh, one person that went in and they purchased a house that had the old chimneys from the 50s. And then the people who had owned the home before them went in and put, you know, put an insert in, which then required them to put the metal flue. So if they aren't using the, the insert as a, as a heating source or whatever, I know that at least one person went in and took that, took the insert out and then was able to take the, the metal out and they just left the chimney closed into the house but left it open at the top and the Swifts do use it, but they, the people don't use it for heating. So it, it kind of did not matter to them. They were more interested in having the Swifts there than using it for heating. So depending, I guess, on how that metal flue system was, you know, put in there, I don't know how it might've been anchored in there, but that is a, that was a possibility for, I know of at least one person that was able to do that. But if it is, if the opening is big enough and it is metal on the inside, if the interior that is lined in metal is wide enough and big enough for the Swifts to get in, I do know of people who have gone in with like a T111 or a rough side, rough sawn plywood and put the plywood inside of the metal, but then they don't use the chimney at all for the people and they converted it so that the interior was was rough enough for the Swifts to cling to. Great, that's, that's great information, thanks. We have another question from John who asks if screech owls or other small owls are a problem for nest sites. Um, I've never heard of anyone having a problem with, with screech owls or any other owls because the Swifts enter from the top and drop down in like a little parachute uh, I've had I've had the question asked, well, do bats use chimney swift towers or chimneys like that? Bats can use chimneys like masonry chimneys that might have openings in the brick that are well, like collapsing or whatever. But bats don't bats tend to go up from the bottom and then work their way up like behind shutters and things like that. But they don't tend to enter from the top. So don't necessarily ever find that the bats and the swifts are you know, vying for the same nesting area, the same thing with the owls. Unless there's an opening in the side of, say, a masonry chimney that creates a cavity that the owls could use, then that could be different. But if the structure is, is tight and the same all the way up, then I would say no, that that wouldn't be a site that an owl would look for, especially a screech owl. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a comment here from one of our attendees who says your presentation should be given to the Lake County commissioners. They moved to Lake County this year and were shocked one night at the mosquito spraying truck that went down their street. Um, Lake County needs these towers. I, I will give this presentation to anyone and everyone who would like to know more about it. I've given it several times to municipalities that after seeing it then agreed to have towers put up and saved money on mosquito spraying. So please uh, contact me. I've got my uh, email there at the bottom. I will be happy to travel anywhere to, you know, get towers put up and get people to stop spraying. That's great. 
Uh, Sheila asks, is anyone keeping statistics on how successful towers are when they're put up to replace a former site? Um, she has had success herself and was wondering about um, other sites. So far, the ones that I know of, Sheila, that I've been uh, help, of help to the people, I would say that right now uh, I'm at a, like a 50-50 where some of them that have uh, been put up some of the areas may not have been conducive, but some of them took three to four years for the Swifts to find them. And so while they've been up for a while, now they are being they are being used. So I don't know of all of the ones that have been put up in, in all places around Ohio and how successful they've been, but all of the ones that I know of that were placed near an existing Swift um, nesting site all of those have been adopted and used by other SWIFTs. Great. Well, here's a good question from John who asks, when siting a freestanding tower, should it be kept in an open area or is it okay if it's in a yard near a tree? It is okay if it's in a yard near a tree, as long as the tree within 12 inches is not causing an issue for a SWIFT to come parachuting out of the sky into the hole. So they can direct their flight so that they can get in and under tree branches. But if it's a big tree that's got a lot of cover, even if it is um, more than 12 inches above, it would be a little helpful to move it out a little more into the open. But again, if you've got trees that have larger branches where the squirrels or the raccoons could drop onto the tower from those overhanging branches, that might be a, another reason why not to put them too close to a tree or with a larger tree that over the years, the branches will have a, you know, a further reaching spread that could potentially cover the tower closer than 12 inches above the opening that that is something to just be mindful of when you might be siting your tower or your chimney. Great. Uh, Sheila has a quick follow up question here. Um, she's wondering if there's a clearing house for reporting successes with replacement towers. Uh, that's a great question that I don't know of. I do know that you can, excuse me, <coughs> list your tower uh, through the, I think, chimneyswift.org, but it's possible that maybe some of the um, web uh, the sites that are social media sites i don't know yet if they have an area where people can report mainly because i'm not on those sites <coughs> excuse me sorry <coughs> getting a drink here yep no problem <laughs> That would be great if we could find that out. Yeah, I was I was just looking to see if uh, Nest Watch has added that yet, and they haven't. Um, but I would say it would be good to include that information in eBird. Um, so if you if you have a tower and you are getting occupancy by that, um, maybe enter those data with photos um, in an eBird checklist. eBird's a great idea, Matt. Uh, I know a lot of people report to it. So that really would be, um, I'd like to work more closely with people around Ohio that may be advocating, you know, putting up towers and let's try to create a clearing house of that information. That would be awesome. Tim has a really good question here. Um, so I'm going to read it and let you get a drink of water. <laughs> um, he asks, <laughs> what were the historical SWIFT population numbers from the 19th and 20th centuries? Um, and separately, are you aware of any increase in the numbers of organizations that build towers to help homeowners build towers? So, <laughs> part <me>. one. <laughs> okay, part one. Um, one of the things that we oh, do know- Your microphone. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yep. One of the things that we do know is that a lot of our early naturalists and just regular old people that were out and about, they reported numbers of swifts, especially during migration, that were not quite to the passenger pigeon level, but to the point where there would be 
hundreds of thousands of birds, you know, in areas and going into dead trees or, or whatever, or even during the 1800s, they were noticing them in these chimneys that were actually quite large. Um, so part of that is a huge, we do know that the numbers were very large. And I think the other part of the question, which really is an important thing to, to be aware of, is that a lot of the parks are trying to put towers in their park areas mainly because people are out walking and when they complain about the mosquitoes people often ask why they are not spraying for the mosquitoes so the parks kind of really don't want to do that um, to be spraying so there are many park districts that are trying to add towers to their areas and then there was another part to that question matt could you say it again yeah, are there any organizations that will help build towers for homeowners who might be interested in, in putting up towers? Right, so Matt and I had this discussion yesterday during our practice that that seems to be the biggest uh, stumbling block right now. I've got uh, probably, I don't know, two or three dozen people that would like towers, but either can't build their own or don't wanna build their own. And so I'm sending out an appeal to people all the time, whether they be uh, woodworkers or retired folks or some of, some of the community colleges that have uh, a construction degree and things like that. Because I know that if we could find people, I've, re I've reached out to some of the Amish uh, community because they do a lot of that uh, creation of those types of things for the birds. Um, I would love to find some people who could build towers to either sell to people or come in and erect towers and get paid for it because I certainly don't want you know I want every, everybody to be happy about what they're doing and providing these nesting sites but that does seem to be the biggest um, stumbling block or uh, tough part to get people that can build them because we have plenty of people that want them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. That seems like a, a void that some entrepreneur would want to fill. Um, so if you're joining us today and you've got some spare time and <laughs> <That's right. laughs> want to help with this, there's a great opportunity there. Um, I'll just tack on real quick to the historical comment before I ask a, a question uh, before we wrap up here. Um, yeah, one of the things I enjoyed most about working on uh, at least the analysis and writing of the Breeding Bird Atlas was diving back into Ohio's uh, historical ornithological literature. Um, and so we, we had some great uh, naturalists in the 1800s and early 1900s, so Wheaton, Jones, and Hicks. Um, and by the, the turn of the 1900s, Chimney Swifts were documented pretty much statewide and called common and abundant by those early Ohio naturalists. And so, you know, even with so much less development, um, they were clearly taking advantage of natural nest sites. And so um, it's amazing to think about this species. Um, and I would, I know that they nest in ash trees on our property. I've yet to find a, a nest site um, just like you, but um, it's amazing to think about how how abundant they were um, in our forests and how disturbance and other things may have may have helped to aid those populations. Um, and I just had one quick question for you. I, I was glad that you mentioned uh, the importance of the towers uh, for families throughout the breeding season. And there's been a lot of observational work documenting um, potential helpers during the breeding season. We know that other species like tit mice um, blue jays and some others actually stick together as family units and young from a previous breeding season can help uh, the adults raise the young in the next season. And Dexter himself actually published a, a lot of papers on um, seeing trios and family units uh, during the breeding season. And I wonder in, in all of your work with uh, towers and observing chimney swifts, if you've documented uh, helpers and if you have any um, suspicions as to whether or not there might be some genetic relatedness of helpers and how that might aid in success, because it's still kind of a gap um, that's been identified in, in research. 
Well, I do know, Matt, with my towers, I might have a family of four um, that you would see four birds out knowing that there were still a couple of young ones still in the nest that had or still in the tower that hadn't come out. But once they were all out, it might be four young or five young with the two adults, which makes, you know, six or seven or eight, depending on the number of young. But then at night when I'm watching to see who goes into the tower, then I'm seeing 11 or 12 or 13 birds going in. And usually that is um, earlier, like not necessarily when the young are obviously at, at egg stage because then they wouldn't be flying, but as they are out and flying and they come back in at night, it's clearly more than that current family. And I have seen that year after year which without having them banded or really knowing that one is from, you know, uh, a family from the previous year, I do know that they are certainly very tied to, you know, my yard. I see them sort of making the same swirls at night that they do before they actually enter into the tower. So I know that it's more than just the family of the year it's and so it likely is the young of the previous year that then joined them, which maybe did not find a mate and they were other places in the area, but then they come into that tower at night. But I do know that it seems like more than two birds may be bringing food to the young when they're in the nest, which makes me think that they are likely young from previous years. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a big gap. So if we have any researchers joining us today, um, there is a, a potential project for you or graduate students. Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they're, they're uh, birds of the world, formerly all about birds, or excuse me, uh, birds of North America. You know, they identify that as a major research gap in understanding uh, behavioral ecology during the breeding season and genetic relatedness and the importance of that. So Anyway, I just wanted to pick your brain on that. Um, I always found it interesting to see family units together or multiple birds during courtship. So um, thanks again. Uh, looks like we may have one more question. Last question from Tim and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, are there any North American species of swifts declining at similar rates to chimney swifts? Black swift or anything else that, that you're aware of? Well, I, I mostly know about the chimney swifts. I know that you know, that's the one basically um, east of the Rockies. And I know on the, you know, Western part, they have other Swifts and there are other Swifts around the world that we're noticing. And, and I read a lot about the Swifts in Europe and that, but they do create, they can enter their little structures on houses and they actually build these, these um, areas on their buildings to attract these Swifts. But most of the man Matt can probably attest to more of it with the research that he does, but most of the stuff that I've read and followed have been mostly on the chimney swift and the decline has really, I mean, it's, it's eye opening. It's really amazing how the decline just keeps getting, you know, getting worse. We do do a, a real number on getting rid of dead trees that could be the natural, you know, cavity hollows for them. And as we take up more and more of our forests and log more areas out and open these areas, if we're not taking down those dead trees and, and the swifts could use them, it's just that we tend to do a, you know, like a wholehearted cut where we take it all out, take it to bare ground, and then maybe not even build anything on it for many years. And so that takes out that area as well. But I'm just finding that the decline is a big decline between the chemicals and the shortage of housing that seems to cause this species uh, the greatest stress and, and therefore the greatest decline. Yeah, yeah. my knowledge of other Swiss species in North America is that as far as I know, they're, they're all declining. Um, I'm not sure about the rates compared to chimney swift. I think Chimney swift is among the highest in part, as you're saying, they, they have a very widespread distribution, particularly in an area that's being developed pretty rapidly like throughout a lot of Eastern North America. So I think their, their decline is, is amongst the highest, but um, I'd have to do a little bit more digging and maybe we can all after this go on to the Breeding Bird Survey results website and, 
<laughs> comb through uh, some, some of the results. Uh, on and you that. know, Matt, just to follow up on that, you know, um, having urbanization come into where they normally would nest isn't a bad thing if we could, for every new building we add, if we add a, a chimney to it or a tower to it for them, then, then that would be really great. Uh, because it is the the fact that the humans are creating the nest sites that they can use. We just need to have more of them being a part of any new building complex that we create. So if we're creating a business park, that would be great to have a couple of these buildings actually have in their plans to erect a nice, big, tall, masonry, brick, whatever, stone chimney that could be just for the Swifts. Yeah, I agree. Um, we can we can do it safely for birds. Um, right, so right. With that, um, again, Judy, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's always great. I, I learned some things today. So thank you for everyone joining us today. Um, this is our last webinar of the year, but we'll be back early next year. So everybody enjoy your holidays. Uh, hopefully you eat well and spend time with friends and family um, over the next few weeks. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Care, everyone. Get those swift towers up. <laughs> Ask Santa for one. <laughs> I know I'm going to. <laughs> Have a good one, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, you too.